afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our uh, afternoon book talk. My name is William Pomerantz, and I'm deputy director here at the Kennan Institute. And we are pleased to sponsor today's book talk with Dr. Catherine Graber on her recent book, Mixed Messages. Before we get started, I just wanted to remind you that you can stay up to date with upcoming events and publications on our website. And you can find our latest analysis of events in Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia uh, by going to our blogs at The Russia File and Focus Ukraine. We are very excited to have Dr. Graber here, uh, especially because she is one of many former Title VIII scholars. And the Wilson Center is very appreciative of the Title VIII program. Uh, who we, we have been a longtime grantee, and it allows us to support young scholars who are working on interesting and very innovative projects, such as uh, Catherine Graber. A reminder to our audience, uh, if you have questions for us, uh, you can submit them by email to kennan at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Kennan Institute, or on our Facebook page. Please include your name and affiliation when sending uh, your questions. Uh, one more piece of, of, of information. Uh, if you're interested in buying uh, this book, you can get 30% off on your purchase uh, by using the code FLYER09 on the Cornell University website. And if you need assistance on that, please email our staff at Kennan Institute at wilsoncenter.org. So Catherine Graber is an assistant professor of anthropology and Central Eurasian studies at Indiana University, Bloomington. Uh, she is a linguistic and sociocultural anthropologist, and she researches minority language politics, multilingualism, mass media, and intellectual property in Russia and Mongolia. In addition to mixed messages, uh, she is the co-editor of Storytelling, as narrative practice, ethnographic approaches to the tales we tell with Brill in 2019. She is widely published in the Slavic Review and other leading journals. Uh, she has won major grants uh, and she is also an award-winning award teacher teaching courses at uh, Indiana University that bridge anthropology and area studies. She has a PhD in anthropology from the University of Michigan and Catherine, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Will. I'd like to um, thank Will Pomerantz and Victoria uh, Pardini for the invitation to come back to the Kennan Institute, if not in the flesh in DC, at least in digitized spirit. And um, I'd like to thank Gerald, uh, Jared Thompson and Stacey Fitzgerald today for their technical support as well. Um, and I'd like to thank the by now literally thousands of people who've contributed to the research I'm going to discuss today, most of whom are not credited in the book by name to protect their anonymity, but some of whom might be with us today. It's one of the advantages um, of, the, of the digital era in which we find ourselves forced online during pand the pandemic, I have to say. So the book project that I'm going to be discussing today is really indebted to my time at the Kennan Institute and at the Wilson Center. Um, a fellowship there in 2012 gave me the space to get some distance on my doctoral research and mo probably most importantly, um, at talks held at the Wilson Center and over lunches and inside conversations, um, I had the experience of policy oriented scholars and journalists and members of the DC community generally asking me a different set of questions about my research in Russia than humanists and social scientists in the university setting that I was immediately coming from um, usually had. So anthropologists generally study some particular cultural phenomenon or social institution to illuminate some more general truth about human experience writ large. And we look to diversity to see the you know, whole range of ways in which humans can organize themselves. But the questions that people were asking me in DC weren't like, what does this tell me about humans as much as how does this help me understand Russia right now? Um, or the current moment? Or is there something about Buryatia that can help me understand Navalny's rise in popularity? Navalny was already a major, an emerging major figure in 2012 um, in Russian politics. So it forced me to think about politics in many ways. Um, and also at Kennan and in DC in conversations, I found myself repeating a couple of things that became really central to the, the book. One was that 
ethnicity may be the grounds for potential conflict, although it obviously isn't always, um, but the substance of ethnicity isn't as straightforward as census data would suggest. And so when you say, you know, there are X number of ethnic Buryats, like what does that really mean? Who's actually, who's, who's, um, who's counting themselves and what does it mean to count yourself as, as, as an X, as a Buryat or whatever. Um, and the second thing was that, you know, the second thing I found myself saying over and over again is that, you know, minority media are not inherently oppositional. They're not inherently confrontational or incendiary. Um, they can be used in many different ways and often perform very assimilatory functions as well as, um, as, well as being spaces for opposition, potential opposition um, sometimes. Um, but that's, it is so culturally and, and historically specific um, how minority media function. And so that became also a very important part of my, part of my research. And I really have my time at the Kennedy Institute to, to thank for being able to articulate those, um, those interventions. Um, so I'm going to organize my talk today around, oops, first I'm gonna share my screen. That's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to organize my talk today around three uh, questions. What do people themselves take to be the substance of ethnic belonging? How do marginalized people reclaim their right to participate in shaping their future and the future of their our countries? Um, oh, I'm sorry, not that. That's not what I'm going to say. <laughs> um, the first of the three questions I'm gonna, going, to, going to address is what do people take themselves Sorry, what do people themselves take to be the substance of, of, ethnic, of ethnic belonging? Um, and I'll get to the other two. I'll get to the other two in a minute. Um, the, the, the easy way for me to, to suggest what ethnic belonging sort of means to people in Buryatia is to show you a, uh, a picture from a photograph from an event and unpack it a little bit. So I didn't write about this event in the book but it, it visually encapsulates multiple, multiple um, ways in which people imagine the middle research in Ulan Ude, the capital of the Republic of Buryatia. It featured children almost exclusively racialized as Buryat in Buryat national dress, singing songs and reciting poems and performing national Buryat dances very much according to the style of formal formatted culture that will be very familiar to anyone from or in post-Soviet space. And the sentiment on the projection screen is which is like long live the, eternally live the um, Buryat mother language or our Buryat mother language. Not incidentally, this event was advertised around Ulan Ude more often in Russian as like Dien Buryatskova Yazika than by its Buryat title. And many of the attendees were what is often called by linguists semi-speakers, that is people who know some of the language but don't control it well enough or across enough domains to be considered full speakers by other native speakers of the language. And that tenuousness of display is also, the tenuousness of knowledge rather, is, is also on display in this awkwardly rendered classical Mongolian script along the side here. Um, the artist is a full Buryat speaker with knowledge of, of Buryat in Cyrillic, but he doesn't control, it didn't control um, the classical Mongolian script. And so he was copying it without knowing all of the ligatures. And so it looks, ends up looking kind of, kind of awkward. But what greater you know, demonstration of the vitality and the future of a minoritized language is there than children performing it on stage? And so when people think about you know, being Buryat and what it means to be Buryat, um, this is like a classic sort of stagey, highly formatted um, presentation of, of ethnicity. And the attempt to, to, um, to portray Buryat here with its infelicities in this classical Mongolian script shows how much the event organizers seek a kind of semiotic correspondence between youth and national dress and dance and writing system and linguistic performance to create this sort of audiovisual display of vitality um, such that the audiovisual display of vitality of the Buryat language will suggest a future for the Buryat people. So it's, it's that kind of, uh, these daily attempts to renegotiate these kinds of, and maintain these kinds of correspondence, which are, have to be made. They have to be made and remade, right? They can't, they don't, they aren't just 
given <laughs> by like organically by the world. They have to be remade and, and renegotiated constantly. Those kinds of correspondence are the substance of my book with Cornell University Press. As a linguistic anthropologist, I was especially interested in how in Buryatia, as in many other parts of the former Soviet Union and former communist states, language has become the touchstone and often the battleground for much broader socio-political struggles. So, and the primary way that language is available and materialized in people's daily lives is through conversation and mass media. So that is what I aimed to capture in mixed messages. The book shows how media in the Russian Federation's Buryat territories create and maintain a minority language public that plays an outsized role in ethno-national politics, but that nonetheless is rapidly shrinking and struggling to redefine itself in a new global era. So specifically, the project examines how authorities, activists, and ordinary citizens in Soviet and post-Soviet Russia have used media institutions to develop and maintain models of citizenship. It methodologically links institutions and the everyday. And what I mean by that is that researchers studying mass media, not only in our part of the world in Russia and former Soviet Union, but also more generally, select as their object either media producers or media audiences, or sometimes the texts and broadcasts and so on that are produced. And that can show really well how institutions hope to drive social and linguistic change or how um, and engender certain kinds of belonging. And it can show how audience members interpret what's said on news programs. But I wanted to bring media producers and consumers together into the same framework and trace examples through the production and distribution process to elucidate how the language and knowledge used and manufactured in institutional settings, like media institutions, circulates from and into other domains of daily life. So uh, the, the project follows individuals, including journalists and other media creators, but not only, across different social contexts to see how they invoke different scales of belonging for different purposes at different moments. Um, and all of this using the Buryat language and Buryat territories of Russia as an extended case study. So I conducted long-term fieldwork in the Buryat territories over five periods between 2005 and 2012 for a total of 20 months. And then I continued past 2012 with some digital ethnography, um, which I was doing while I was at the Kennan Institute and beyond. Um, and, which I've, and, I, and I won't talk too much about that today, but what I found in that um, digital ethnography in a nutshell that many of the same strategies for policing who counts as a good Buryat and who should be taken as an authoritative speaker of Buryat are being extended into the digital sphere. And most people are effectively re-territorializing Buryatia by insisting on physical linkages to the homeland, especially in light of a growing um, Buryat diaspora in which it's becoming kind of untethered and unclear to people who should count and who shouldn't count. There's a kind of like effort to re-territorialize, an impulse to re-territorialize. Um, and that data appears in chapter seven of the book. So the Buryat territories lie on the Russian-Mongolian border in Asia, about three and a half days from Moscow by train, a number that looms large in people's minds because you have to know how far you are from the metropole at all times. Um, and they include the Republic of Buryatia, which is a semi-autonomous ethnic republic, and two smaller territories, Aga and Ustorda, which were dissolved and merged into the surrounding Russian-dominated regions by administrative restructuring and federal recentralization during my research. That was part of the um, so-called regathering of the lands that occurred over those years. Um, so the mergers, those mergers of Aga and Ustorda, bear on our topic today because they raised the political status of speaking and the political stakes of speaking or of not speaking Buryat. In discussions leading up to the dissolution of Ustorda, some proponents of dissolution claimed that the fact that most Buryats there no longer spoke Buryat proved that political autonomy hadn't actually worked to maintain an identifiable Buryat culture. And similar arguments have been uh, circulated to dis justify dissolving the Republic of Buryatia. And those arguments have not been made in Aga because Aga actually does have a very strong language preservation relative to the other regions. Um, uh, but argument, those arguments have been made um, to justify dissolving the Republic of Buryatia, and those remain rumors, um, but the threat of using language preservation as a criterion for ethnic political autonomy has understandably inspired anxiety over the erosion of the principle of ethno-national autonomy, and it's raised to the stakes of speaking. So I collected 
um, ethnographic, sociolinguistic, and archival data on Buryat Russian language use and on the development, production, and consumption of local media across a range of platforms, including print, radio, television, and um, digital media, as I mentioned. Um, and during all five research periods, I was based in Ulan Ude, where I lived with um, host families and in private apartments and briefly in the dormitory of Buryat State University. From this base, I conducted field research at different times in most of the districts of the Republic in Ustarda and Aga. So Ulan Ude, um, which was my focus, is perhaps best known for hosting the world's largest head of Lenin, which is his whole own story. <laughs> but it's also a multi-ethnic, multilingual post-Soviet city that bears the traces of Buryatia's long integration into the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union in more subtle ways than the giant head. There are Ukrainians, Armenians, Azerbaijanis, Tatars, and so on in Ulan Ude, in addition to native Evenki, Soyots, and Buryats alongside Russians. It's majority Russian by ethnicity, according to the 2020 census, and overwhelmingly the language of public life is Russian, which leads to a kind of stereotype that it's primarily a Russian-speaking city. And indeed, part of what being uh, urban, being Garadskoy in Buryatia, um, part of being ur urban in Buryatia means speaking Russian. And that's not true just in Buryatia, that's true in a lot of parts of Russia, right? Where like part of, part of being Garadskoy is speaking Russian. But there are many Buryat-speaking families in Ulan Ude who use Buryat at home and in religious contexts. And in my research, I focused on institutional contexts, namely media institutions, where Buryat was used alongside or instead of Russian in the workplace. So it does function as a, as a, a sort of public language in these very limited ways. One of the main things I show in the book is that Buryat is looked down upon in some contexts, but it's valorized in certain other contexts and by certain audiences. So in other words, it's not a matter of simply being prestigious or not, right? It's not a matter of like Buryat being the um, not prestigious and Russian being prestigious or vice versa. So reasons you might temporarily use Buryat, even if you use Russian most of the time in your daily life, include because you're going to a Buddhist uh, datsan or a shamanic ceremony that's heavily associated with Buryatness, perhaps because you're de demarcating a domestic sphere or domestic space that's comfortable with friends or family, or perhaps because your coworkers use Buryat and you're trying to fit in. Maybe you're trying to get a job at a Buryat owned, um, an ethnically Buryat owned business, for example. So methodologically, this was a three First, I wanted to show how media become the material stuff of people's daily lives. Let's, you know, how they're, how they're used, sometimes not for the purposes for which they were intended. Um, in these slides, um, pages of Buryat Unen, um, the flagship Buryat language newspaper for the Republic of Buryatia are being used to wrap sacred Bur uh, Buddhist texts in place of uh, traditional silk brocade and to cover an offering plate, for example. Um, or, um, it, yeah, they're not necessarily, there's, sometimes they're used for purposes other than, they're circulated for purposes other than what were intended. So I was interested in how, um, for example, this, this video um, made by a, a babushka grandmother who is sort of doting on her grandson um, was recirculated to different purposes on YouTube when it became an, it became an opportunity. It was just supposed to be a cute, clearly just supposed to be a cute video, but, but it became an opportunity for commentators to write in about how, geez, like it's obvious that the, you know, the babushka, the grandmother and her grandson are both Buryat, by which they were, they were making, they were engaging in racial guessing. Um, uh, it's clear that they're both Buryat. Why are they speaking in Russian? It would be so much better if the grandmother spoke Russian with her grandson and then somebody else writes in and says, you know, lay off, <laughs> like leave her alone, just like he's a cute kid. Um, but these, so these become opportunities um, in the digital sphere, it becomes an opportunity to engage in a kind of like policing again, of who should be speaking how and why, even though that was not how the, how the video was intended as, as an example. So my research included a lot of time in people's homes. I did a household media survey of, of about 60 households in both urban contexts and in rural areas in the districts of, of Buryatia, um, where I observed different media practices and recorded what was in people's homes, interviewed people and often watched TV or listened to the radio or played video games or otherwise participated in daily media practices, um, sometimes badly. I'm not a good video game player, for example. Um, this image on the top left is from a villager's home in Eastern Buryatia, but what it 
the Picts is really typical of the area. Circulating through any one household might be Tibetan texts, there's some here, Tibetan texts, handwritten Buryat prayers, right here, um, Russian language newspapers produced at the level of the Federation, like I see Rasiskaya Gazeta up here, um, or in Ulan Ude at the level of the Republic. I see Buryad, Buryad Unen is down here, you can see that little pink thing. Um, Shows us Buryat Unen. And then, you know, in addition to this, there's, it's not in this picture, but there's, there might also be a cell phone that is running Facebook in Russian and English. Really, a wealth of multilingual media that are produced and that circulate at multiple overlapping scales at the same time, and that are then experienced on a daily basis by people as a kind of melange of languages and styles and sources, and that become then resources to draw on in conversations and um, with, with people at different scales. So I focus in the book on mid-level regional scales of belonging between the sort of hyper-local and the federation, um, between like this, this hyper-local level and the, and the federation. And I intend that, I intend this in part as a corrective to studies of media and globalization because in our increasing analytical focus on the local and the global, we risk, re, we risk losing the regional. Um, and in a multinational state like the Russian Federation, it is at this middle regional level where most ethno-national politics play out. So media produced by and for the Republic of Buryatia, Aga and Ustorda most clearly articulate both you know, explicitly and more often implicitly, the position of Buryats and Buryatia within national and global imaginaries. And this is also the, the sort of scale at which most native language media are produced, not you know, the newspapers of factories, although they might be in our schools and not at the federal level, it's almost exclusively in Russian. So I also wanted to document um, un and understand the linguistic practices and ideologies of the journalists and activists who produce this minority language media. So I interviewed journalists and conducted workplace observation at media institutions. This is the Buryat State, Buryatia State Television and Radio Broadcasting Company in Rwanda Day, for example. Um, so it was a bigger one in smaller places as well. This is the Aginsky affiliate of the Chita um, State Television Radio Company. Um, and wherever possible, I shadowed reporters and followed the editing process, including many occasions on which I was interviewed myself, and that became a major sort of research um, research method, actually. Um, and, and actually, those became like you know, being able to follow moments in which I'd been interviewed myself became some of the more important parts of my research because I got to see how um, and, and following them, shadowing them. I got to see how teams of television journalists, for example, um, but radio and, and um, newspaper journalists as well, negotiate the relationship between Buryat and Russian, how they decided what would be in Buryat and, how, and what would be in Russian, as opposed to you know, top-down policy decisions that are exclusively like implemented or not implemented, like how, how in the sort of fine-grained daily interactions do these teams actually decide what to put in Russian and what to put in Buryat, what to do with these two languages. And also how they convinced um, members of the public to be interviewees, often when they were very hesitant to speak Buryat on, camp on camera or just outright refused for some reasons that I'll go into in a, in a second. Um, and then, you know, a, a great thing about this method was that then I could watch the resulting broadcasts with audience members in their homes and in interviews and focus groups to kind of complete the circle of, of um, production and consumption and circulation. And finally, I did a lot of archival research. So Buryatia has a robust and deep history of printing, both in early book printing in Buddhist monasteries like Kasunas Yorsk and Tsongol and Aga, and in early print journalism with newspapers that were based in Verkhneyodinsk, Ulanode's predecessor, and run mainly by Jewish editors until the Bolshevik Re Revolution. So two traditions, that two print traditions that date to the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And I point that out partly because it's, it's very tempting a lot of contemporary Buryats have the impression that their um, that their print history and their media um, begin with the Soviets, but that's not at all the case. There's a it's a it's a sort of that's sort of a tragic um, sort of outcome of the Soviet period is that um, there's a over an over reliance on the uh, this narrative of the Soviets having brought um, more 
aspects of civilization and printing than they, than they, than they really did. Um, but the newspapers, the long run of newspapers makes it possible to get a sense of how the relationship between Russian and Borea in print has changed over more than a century. Um, and as any historians watching this know, one of the great things about conducting research in the former Soviet Union is that state socialism as a regulatory system compelled everyone, including journalists and administrators and media institutions, to constantly self-document. So editorial meetings today are not well recorded, and a lot of decision making happens informally in side conversations. But during the Soviet period, the editorial board of a newspaper or a radio station was nearly synonymous with the Communist Party organization of the institution. And they kept assiduous notes of what amounted to editorial board meetings. And those documents are really rich, including a lot of explicit discussion about linguistic decisions, challenges producers faced in creating Buryat materials, and how what they imagined their audience to be. And I point this out partly because those are really underused, not just in Buryatia, but in other parts of Russia, really underused um, archives. Um, so when I started fieldwork for this project in 2005, I was interested in Buryat as a case of language maintenance. There are about 329,100 total self-reported speakers of Buryat today, um, and that based on census, census figures. And they're concentrated in Russia and Northern Mongolia and in the Shinahin region of Inner Mongolia in this People's Republic of China. In the last All Russia um, census that has been, you know, that we have all the data from, um, was conducted in 2010, there were 218,557 people within the Russian Federation who reported controlling um, Buryat. And then several thousand of these respondents re reported their ethnicity as something other than Buryat, um, or Tatars and Ukrainians and Russians, especially. Um, but most said they were Buryat, and most lived in the Republic of Buryatia and the neighboring Buryat territories. So that makes the Buryat territory is sort of the, the homeland, as people often call it uh, there, um, of Buryat. And it, the, the number of speakers makes Buryat one of the major indigenous languages of North Asia, second only to Sakha Yakut. Um, despite over four centuries of Russian Buryat contact in which Russian has decidedly been the code of general political and economic power. So I thought of this as, a, as a, an example of amazing sort of language maintenance in the face of crazy odds against anybody speaking Buryat at all. But it turned out that what I witnessed over those years of my research was a particularly stark decline in the language. And by decline, I mean that dramatically fewer people report, um, dramatically fewer people report knowledge of Buryat and that the language was overall being used in fewer contexts. Um, so from generation to generation, speakers in Buryatia have been shifting from Buryat um, which was, as, as recently as the 19th century, kind of a, a regional lingua franca to, to Russian. So in living memory, there have been two periods of dramatic language shift. So a sense, that's important because it means that a sense of decline permeates most people's perception. And one, so one accompanied um, uh, rapid urbanization and industrialization in the 1960s, when large numbers of ethnic outsiders came into Buryatia from Ukraine and the Caucasus, um, Azerbaijan, Armenia, other parts of the Soviet Union, and everyone relied more heavily on Russian as a lingua franca, understandably. So this period in particular produced what is now felt as a generation gap between knowledgeable Buryat elders and their Russian dominant adult children. Um, and the second occurred over the years covered in the book. So in the 2002 All-Russia Census, 72% of the total Buryat population of the Russian Federation reported knowledge of Buryat. And by the 2010 census, that number had fallen to 45%. And in the Republic of Buryatia, the population reporting knowledge of Buryat fell from 81% to 43%. So the dizzying, although I should say that the percentage of Buryats reporting um, their native language as Buryat remained constant and high at 82%, which is also fascinating actually. So the dizzying drop is likely due in part to changes in how linguistic knowledge is under and reported on as a whole. It's common former Soviet Union to consider one's native language, the Hradnoi Yazik, to be one's heritage or ancestral language, regardless of actual competence. 
and Russian censuses have been uneven in how or whether they elicited the distinction between a language that one knows or uses and a language that one affiliates with. So there's always a dis huge discrepancy actually between what sociolinguistic surveys find on that point and what census figures show. So, but still, even, even granted that, in under a decade, the census figures suggest significant shift away from Buryat. And more subtly over those years, Buryat was receding from public life, albeit kind of unevenly. So in the book, I argue that making and consuming media and using language are daily practices by which people perform and negotiate their citizenship within different scales of belonging, the Federation, the Republic, and the clan, or, or sorry, the city or the district, um, as well as clans and ancestral lineages and extended families. And Buryat and Russian speaking publics that are aligned with state borders unevenly at best. So I promised I'd come to a second question. <laughs> um, my second question is what forms of national revitalization or linguistic and cultural revolution are possible in the 21st century? Um, and all these questions came out of, again, came out of conversations um, that I found myself having in DC and at the Kennedy Institute quite often actually. Um, so what does it mean to, 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 uh, to reclaim um, ethnic belonging? Uh, massive social transformations over the 20th and 21st centuries have left many people in Buryatia with a profound sense of loss and seeking reclamation. And I really think that reclamation is the right word in English. Um, often you use the term revitalization, right? So, and, and people in Buryatia will often talk to in forms of national revitalization. But, but what people are seeking is to reclaim something that they feel was, un, was taken un, from them unfairly. Because the Buryat language has been so strongly tied to a sense of Buryat belonging, loss of the language has come to index or point to um, a broader loss of cultural continuity. Thus, language has become a touchstone in debates over Buryat cultural loss and a central domain for reclamation. However, the specific media and linguistic resources available for performing that reclamation have been shaped by state-driven modernizing projects that were never felt to be complete and that ironically hastened the very changes that are now being battled against. So this has created a serious disjuncture that makes it very difficult to speak Borgat today in socially satisfying ways. And individuals reveal this disjuncture, which is to say, you know, they reveal the impact of past Soviet projects on their daily lives and their personhood in all kinds of subtle ways. The power of ethnography and ethnographic writing is in showing that, that interplay between broad socio-political and historical forces and people's minute everyday interactions. And that's what I try to do in the book. So by the same token, I'd like to address Soviet state policies of minority inclusion and exclusion for the remainder of my talk today by beginning not with historical background, but rather with a question that reveals the lasting impact of those policies. And this is especially in um, chapter six. I'm going to draw from some material from chapter six. Why don't you know your own language? This is a question that is often said to people, people often say to their relatives or to strangers or silently to themselves. Sometimes it's said with sadness, sometimes with resignation, sometimes as a challenge or angrily. The first time I heard this expression, it was uttered by an elderly babushka, a granny, shaking her cane angrily at a young woman who stood in terrified silence like a deer in headlights, holding a tray of meat dumplings. My friend Darima and I were in a cafe outside of Ulan Ude, and these two babushki grannies speaking Buryat had tried repeatedly to order meat dumplings, um, bozza, from the two young women behind the counter. So these are bozza, uh, or bots. And um, well, the national, the national origins of meat dumplings are hotly debated across Asia. <laughs> I'm into it too, too long without like starting to fight. Um, but the Buryat version looks like this, <laughs> very well loved as a national dish um, of, of Buryatia. Yeah. And then the girls had understood the order or at least part of it, but they answered in Russian to which the babushki replied in Buryat, to which the girls responded in Russian until the babushki began shaking their heads and with increasing frustration, whereupon the girls fell mute. And my friend Darima, sitting opposite me at our creaky little table, clearly didn't want to get involved. I could tell because she like instinctively tucked, ducked her head, just peeking over the top of her milky tea to watch. 
So as the babushki's voices grew louder, a hushed silence fell over the cafe. Everyone's attention trained on the frozen girls, and they were practically in tears, eager to please their elders and running back and forth from the kitchen, but incapable of responding in Buryat. And finally, the girl holding the dumplings broke the silence by setting the tray down with a clatter and splashing some tea out onto the vinyl tablecloth. And the babushki began eating and chatting among themselves, and everyone returned to their own meals as though with a collective sigh of relief. So later I had to ask Darima about the tension in the room, um, which was kind of crazy, and about her own apparent fear of being approached by the elderly women. And this was, so this was early in my field work in 2005, and I was thoroughly an outsider. I did not yet understand how meat dumplings could elicit such terror. And I wasn't the, I wasn't the sort of target of the, the babushki's ire because I'm racialized as European in um, Buryatia. And so they're, they were like, whatever, she doesn't speak Buryat anyway. <laughs> um, but Darima was, was really terrified of being, of being um, sort of called upon to publicly perform Buryat. And she said, when I asked her about this later, she said, well, she pensive and she said, well, you know, we should, you know, it's really hard when they expect you to speak your own language and you can't. Well, and we should, we should speak our own language. So over the next few years, I heard this expression many times. Um, one afternoon, I was sitting with a television journalist, for example, whom I'll call Sayana, and she was reviewing recordings of an interview in Buryat to be edited for the evening news. The guy that she was watching included a lot of ums and pauses. He looked uncomfortable. He frequently switched into Russian, and eventually he pointed to his friend and suggested that they interview him instead. So Sayana, watching this later, was like, she tapped the screen with her pen and just said, why don't you know your own language? But what in the world does that mean, to not know your own language? In post-Soviet Russia, again, people often identify their native language, their, their radnoi yazik, as their heritage or ancestral language, which does not necessarily have anything to do with competence. So a person might identify her native language or own language, svoyik, like Darima is my svoyazik as Buryat based on her cultural or ethnic self-identification as a Buryat without claiming active or passive knowledge of the language's grammar or lexicon. And as for knowing or not knowing, these are variable and shifting attributions. Darima claimed that she had no knowledge of Buryat, even though it was Svoyazik, it was her language, her own language. Um, though I had witnessed her on many occasions carrying on bilingual conversations with her relatives, they speaking Buryat and she responding in Russian. We usually we call it non-accommodating bilingualism in linguistics. There are many people like Darima and the girls at the cafe, especially in their 20s and 30s during my field work, who have excellent passive competence in Buryat, but who cannot or will not speak. Others speak Buryat as a first language, but are more or less illiterate in the literary standard. Or more rarely, someone um, controls the literary standard by using it at school and learning at a university, but has little command of colloquial speech. I was in that category for a while, actually. Um, so there are still more who have little or no passive competence, but excellent knowledge of the pragmatic uses to which Buryat as a code may be put. So an onlooker in the cafe, for example, might not understand what was being said in Buryat, but can recognize when a speaker has switched into it and might understand that the babushki intensified their scolding by conducting it in Buryat, or that performing a toast in Buryat at a banquet demonstrates membership in a broader Buryat community. So those onlookers might be said to possess social or cultural knowledge of the indexical meanings of Buryat, or how Buryat points to larger ethnic, national, gender, or familial identities and affiliations. I mean, in other words, one need not self-identify as a speaker of Buryat to have some sort of knowledge about Buryat, or crucially, to be taken as a speaker by someone else. And it's this possibility, the assumption that a person will speak Buryat in a certain way, that creates problems for the girls in the cafe. Most of the time, they likely get along just fine speaking Russian. Buryat is not often demanded in public life, so it's difficult to fault them for being unable to speak, although the babushki and many of their other elders certainly do so. So we have to ask about the processes by which expectations regarding the locations, uses, and meanings of linguistic practices are invested into persons such that asking a rhetorical question like, why don't you know your own language, makes sense. As unlikely as it may seem in a cafe or a rural banquet, 
the participants of such quotidian interactions are caught up in the same field of language politics as what is battled over in courts, legislative bodies, political speeches, and other forms of politics with a capital P. The questions are the same. Who counts as a speaker? Who counts as a speaker worth listening to? And who has the right to ask? And these questions are all the more poignant and fraught in the context of dramatic social changes that are experienced not only as language shift, but as economic, social, and cultural shift as well, when what is at stake is not only the future of the language, but also because of the particular role that the native language plays in Buryat cultural politics, the future of a minority language public that has been taken to be the substance of the ethno nation. So what can we learn from Buryatia about, this is my last question, <laughs> what can we learn from Buryatia about strategies of diversity and inclusion and their repercussions for elsewhere in the world, elsewhere in Russia and elsewhere in the world? I mean, th this is something unique about post-socialist discourses of, of uh, diversity and inclusion. It's the same global challenge of minority representation and vitality that's faced in colonial contexts and post-colonial contexts rather around the world revitalizing or reclaiming a language is often seen um, as a key to revitalizing and sort of reclaiming cultural continuity and um, self-determination um, of a people and reclaiming ruptured social relations. But in Buryatia and in native Siberia more generally, it has, it has to happen through Soviet specific terms and institutions. Those are the resources that people have available to them. So for people who study minority media and language revitalization outside the former Soviet space, this case presents a real puzzle. Regardless of actual usage or the level of endangerment, Buryat language media are legally provided for by the state on the principle that Buryat is the native, again, meaning ancestral or heritage, in this case, the titular language of the, um, it's the, it's the native language of the titular nationality of the Republic. So, Buryat appears on the signs of state-run buildings alongside Russian, um, like in these libraries. State news organizations and some private media companies provide publications, broadcasts, and limited web services in Buryat. Most of the media produced in Buryat parallels media in Russian, meaning that a radio station, for example, will have a Russian language division and a Buryat language division that may share um, material and stories. So on the face of things, the Soviet state actively encouraged and overtly encouraged, in fact, and promoted the use of Buryat, tying literacy to the ability to drive a tractor and build a city. And this is part of the, the legacy today of, of, um, of Buryat um, media and Buryat language institutions. Moreover, um, um, Consuming media in Buryat could be a, a key way of showing that you're a good Soviet citizen. Um, one of the most important sort of domains for showing good citizenship in the Soviet period was um, writing letters to the editor, showing active engagement with your local newspaper and your news organization. And if this was in Buryatia or in the Buryat language, it was all the more important that it be in Buryat. And it's especially clear um, this, this sort of Way, means of institutionalizing equality is especially clear in how Russian and Buryat were institutionalized alongside one another. So the way that state-funded media today run duplicated news program news programming is based on this system from the from the Soviet period, and all of this should put Buryat on good footing. So conventional wisdom is that from having minority language media itself will be like the magic answer to minority language attrition, like provide it and they will speak, and yet the language, Buryat, is still on the whole receding. Why? Well, in fact, these projects can have unintended consequences, especially when media are built up in an authoritative domain like news media, the exclusion of informal popular genres like children's programming and entertainment. So partly it's that there's less media being produced in Buryat today than in the mid-Soviet period. Um, among the media circulating within the Republic of Buryatia during the period covered in this book, um, there were about 20 minutes each of, um, uh, of a, uh, excuse me, of Buryat language news being daily broadcast on television and radio. Um, there were a handful of newspapers publishing in different formats with, with uh, a 
either Boryat and Russian or mostly in Boryat. There was no exclusively Boryat. There is no exclusively Boryat um, publication, but there, there, there are publications that are framed in Boryat. Um, at the time of my research, field research, there had never been a radio or television station dedicated solely to Boryat language material either. Um, but some journalists were, were in the process of uh, arguing for a radio station, and this became a radio station called Boryat FM, which you can listen to um, online as well. And it's also partly about um, claims to indigeneity. So elsewhere in the world, key goals of minority language media have been language maintenance and revitalization, which in turn have been understood as issues of indigenous rights. But Boryat speakers have not generally taken up or benefited from the romantic rhetoric of indigenous language um, endangerment and death that's often been marshaled in defense of minority language speakers elsewhere. And this is because indigenous rights are not the primary framework in which Boryat leaders and activists have asserted their language rights or their rights to political autonomy. And this is something that I examine at length in the book in chapter one. There's some anxiety in Russia that the Federation will dissolve along ethno-national lines, despite a strong countervailing trend toward ethnic, Russian ethnic nationalism. Central authorities feel it necessary to constantly reaffirm the incorporation of semi-autonomous border republics like the Republic of Buryatia into Russia, as evidenced by the propaganda employed in the 2011 celebration of the 350th anniversary of the voluntary entry of Buryatia into the composition of, of Russia. Um, well, this slogan significantly recasts the story of a violent military conquest and moves the date of creation of a discrete territorial unit called Buryatia earlier by about 250 years. These facts were not lost on the well-educated members of Buryatia's cultural elite, who in 2011 grumbled and sarcastically emphasized the word voluntary, Dabravolnova, the same way I just did it, every time they said it, every time they said the slogan. Perhaps this lack of local enthusiasm is why the campaign slogans had to be repeated on every building, billboard, supermarket, plastic bag, and other available surface that year, and why federal authorities poured funds into conferences, construction projects, events, and public health initiatives in exchange for using some version of the campaign slogans and imagery, even when it made no sense. This lavish campaign 10 years ago revealed deep anxiety on the part of federal authorities that was perplexing to both to me and to the Boryats with whom I spoke that year because it seemed so unnecessary. Most Boryats have internalized a pacifistic, if not passive acceptance of their position vis-a-vis -vis ethnic Russians. But the authorities sending cash were correct to think that residents' ongoing identification with multiculturalism and specifically Russian Boryat brotherhood is a key centripetal force in regional minority politics. Specifically, it has helped ameliorate opposition to the steps Moscow has taken to lessen ethno-national autonomy, including replacing the president of an ethnic republic like Buryatia with um, a head, a glava, and uh, the mergers as well that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. So in both onstage performances and in everyday offstage conversations, speakers invoke the Druzba Narodov, the friendship of the peoples, a popular slogan of the Soviet period, promoting inter-ethnic brotherly love between all peoples of the Soviet Union. And this is the idea illustrated historically um, here, for example, um, with a peasant, a Russian, a stereotyped Russian and a stereotyped Boryat, identifiable by their nationalized, stylized national dress and facial features, shaking hands or linking arms. In the um, lead up to the merger referendums in both Aga and Ustorta, Yadina and Rasia capitalized, United Russia, capitalized on the same imagery, mounting billboards depicting Russians and Boryats in traditional dress um, holding hands with those with those slogans that I just um, showed you, like together we're stronger, or together is better. The friendship of the peoples was widely used across Soviet space, of course, but it took on special importance in Buryatia, where it remains a point of local pride and a powerful deterrent to physical violence, if not latent racism. And there are several reasons for Buryatia's exceptionalism on this count. Um, by the time, which I won't I'll skip in the interest of time, actually. Um, in the, but at present, the Buryat-Russian friendship is part and parcel of Buryatia's identity. It appears everywhere from public service announcements about the year of the family to fashion and grocery advertisements. Um, so some companies are known locally as predominantly Russian or predominantly Buryat with preferential hiring practices within the nationality. Um, 
and other, com other businesses sort of seek to capitalize instead on a kind of middle path. Um, and some of the most successful businesses are actually those that really highlight this kind of, um, this kind of interethnic, interethnic brotherly, brotherly love. So in this self-identification, residents of Buryatia often contrast themselves with what they see as stereotypically violent Chechens, parochial Chukchi, or chauvinistic Russians. And they contrast the Republic of Buryatia with other parts of Russia where racially motivated hate crimes directed most violently and egregiously towards Central Asians, Africans, and people of the Caucasus and Asians have become a part of daily life. Um, now, whether the extent to which it's fair or not is uh, open for debate, but the point is that people feel this way and there's a kind of re-territorialization going on in which people will return to what they see as their ethnic homeland, trying to flee xenophobia in other parts of Russia. And there's ample evidence that, um, that sort of xenophobia and racism toward Buryats is always pushing up against the edges of the Republic of Buryatia. So this um, image from right out taken this is right outside the um, boundaries of the Republic in a ski and ski town and industrial town called Baikalsk. It's where the big Baikalsk paper mill is. Um, this uh, graffiti says Russia для русских, Russia for the ethnic Russians, and is a very sort of standard issue um, xenophobic slogan that you'll see in other parts of Russia, but you don't usually see inside the Republic of Buryatia. Again, though, you see it right outside the borders kind of pushing um, against a tacit agreement that Buryats will not be um, uh, nationalistic as long as Russians refrain from being nationalistic themselves. And with that, I'll end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. Uh, we still have some time for questions, so we're going to. Uh, I'm just going to jump right in uh, with the first question, and then we'll, we have a few questions on on tap. Um, I just wanted to talk to you about this question about uh, the media in in Boryatia and what actually is in native language in Boryat and what is in Russian, and do they switch kind of kind of freely between the languages? Or do they try to concentrate on one language uh, on to, to present uh, the, the, the news and other cultural activities? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually, it's funny because I often forget to even to even describe that because it's so taken for granted in the region, so, take, so taken for granted that what constitutes native language media, and of course this shouldn't be taken for granted, but what constitutes native language media is media that are framed in um, the na native language, and so if an article is framed in Burya, it will have like a Burya uh, title or a headline and then be predominantly in Buryat, but probably with some Russian borrowing, like probably quite a lot of Russian borrowing actually at this point. Um, if it's a television broadcast, it will be on like the television broadcast of Viesti, of like the, the evening news program. So there are separate broadcasts for Russian and for Buryat language material. Now inside of the Buryat um, language material, that is to say inside of the stuff that's framed as being Buryat language or being native language, there will actually be a lot of use of Russian, um, partly through borrowings, especially through interviews, because interviewees will will code switch and will bring in or, or just sort of trans language will move back and forth between, between um, different resources that they have available to them. And so particularly in television interviews, that ends up being a lot of Russian. Um, and then the, you know, the, the anchors will often, this is a major argument of the book actually, is that the, the ways that different people manage this kind of relationship between Russian and Boryat. Um, so anchors will try to adhere to a literary standard and they'll let the interviewees kind of move a little bit more fluidly because they have to, they don't have a choice. So quite a lot of Russian makes its way into media that are framed as Boryat language through individual speakers using, using um, Russian language material. Um, and to some extent other languages as well, but mostly Russian. So it's so it's very much about framing, like whether something is framed as the, a Buryat language broadcast or a Russian language broadcast. Now within those within those um, two broad sort of categories, um, it is over the 20th, 20th and early 20th first centuries, it has become the case that Buryat has taken on more um, importance in domains of like of culture, human interest, what's usually called soft news. And Russian has become increasingly associated with hard news, 
political, political news, um, economic news. Um, and you'll notice that I'm talking almost exclusively about news because most native language media um, in Russia is, is produced in the domain of news um, as an interesting sort of it's an interesting sort of outcome of the way that news was institutionalized in the Soviet period and the way that cadres were, was the way that colonization and indigenization happened in the 1920s and 1930s. Thank you. Uh, we have, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna combine in the interest of time, two questions. One is from Elizabeth Barber from Global Skills, who asked whether you can provide certain tips for those, of, uh, for those scholars and other uh, uh, other people who are working on language preservation and the revitalization of language in these regions. And then the second question is from Marjorie Mumstein Balzer. And she says, uh, uh, she addresses the issue of mixed signals and the current leadership of the Republic on language. Uh, on language. Uh, the Republic head uh, greeted his multi-ethnic citizens in the Boryat language in the lunar uh, Buddhist New Year, um, and she asked, how superficial is this, or does the very symbolism of it give hope for processes of cultural and implicit political reclamation? Yeah, that's, those are both, both really good questions. So the book ends with, thank you for those questions. The book ends with some practical, um, some practical advice that comes out of, you know, practical suggestions that are, uh, um, I think, that are outcomes of this research. What, what does the Boryat case suggest to us for practices of language revitalization more generally? And these came out of, these practical suggestions came out of Boryat um, language activists and journalists asking me um, about the results of my research over the years. So one um, thing that I suggest in the, in, and again, this comes out of, of, out of Boryatia, um, my experience in Boryatia, but one thing that I suggest is that journalists and other language elites, members of the language elite should perhaps relax some of their adherence to the strong literary standard. So um, Buryat is very similar to, a Quechua is another example worldwide of this, um, where there's a very strong uh, uh, investment in a uh, national literary standard. Unified Quechua is what I'm thinking of in the Quechua case. But um, in, in the case of Buryat, there's very good political and historical reasons that people are extremely heavily invested emotionally and politically invested in um, having a strong literary standard Boryat, but it, it is working at cross purposes. Adherence to that standard is working at cross purposes with um, reaching out to some of the semi speakers who could be um, more and would, be, would like to be more um, active in Boryat language maintenance and language revitalization reclamation. So, um, so that is, uh, that is one, one practical sort of solution is to be, to be less, um, less, uh, less to be, to be less sort of stringent about it um but that said i'm not uh i understand the reasons for 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 um for adhering to the literary standard as well the second would be producing more media in 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 Boria in non-news genres so um children's programming is um sought, heavily sought after by parents especially who might not control Boria super well but we hope that their children will children's programming and um more entertainment genres. So a lot of language activists and sort of grassroots efforts uh, in, in Buryatia have focused on subtitling Hollywood films and um, subtitling video games and getting video games into more into more into Buryat language, not just for kids, um, but for, for adults too. So that there are more genres of um, like, like entertainment genres as opposed to just news. Um, to Marjorie's question, Marjorie Belzer's question about uh, the sort of mixed signals being sent, the, the, the um, the use by the head or formerly president of Buryatia of some sort of ceremonial or ritualistic Buryat at the beginning of the Lunar New Year and um, beginning long political speeches is, um, has been standard throughout the 1990s and 2000s. So that's not a new phenomenon. That's something that is, is kind of a requirement. So even when, um, even when Nagavitsin was president, Nagavitsin was uh, an, Ud, he's an Udmurt, he was a political appointee and is not, um, does not have anything to do with Buryatia. And so he arrived knowing no Buryat. And the, there was a lot of consternation, a lot of, a lot of argument about whether or not he needed to learn Buryat formally. And in the end, he, 
you can say he assented and <laughs> started to learn Buryat formally, even when he didn't know Buryat formally, he still had to memorize short greetings that he could say, short Pajalani and short greetings that he could say at the beginning of, of, um, of speeches. Now, this is primarily symbolic at this point because none of the, um, the, the recent, recent um, heads of state of Buryatia have not um, been fluent speakers of Buryat. Um, the first president of Buryatia, Patapov, in the 1990s was um, often commended by, um, he's an ethnic Russian, but he was often commended for speaking Buryat. But uh, since him, there hasn't been anybody who, who, really, who really has. And it's a point of consternation, but yeah, it, it primarily is a matter, it's not exactly a mixed signal, I would say, um, but, but the head of state saying something ceremonial and ritualistically in Buryat is um, a requirement in Buryatia, if nothing else. Thank you, uh, Catherine. Uh, another question from Jessica Strother. Uh, did Russians who interacted with the Buryats in the 19th and early 20th century learn the, learn the language? Yeah, many of them did. In fact, the, um, the earliest editors of Bolshevik newspapers in, um, in uh, Buryatia included Russians, um, ethnic Russians. And so they quickly tried to get out of the way and make some space for, um, for Koronizatia, indigenization, and, and Buryat, uh, uh, it's called Aburyatshevania, like the Buryatization of the, of the cadres um, and of the, of the journalist worker, of the newspaper workers. But many of the earliest, um, many of the earliest media makers of Buryat, Buryat language material were actually um, ethnic Russians um, or, or Jews. That was also, it was also a, a, an important, I mean, ethnic, there's ethnically different categories at the time. Um, in addition, um, a great deal of the earliest work documenting the Buryat language um, for, you know, as a sort of linguistic enterprise of documentation was done by um, missionaries, by Orthodox missionaries. And so the um, um, traders, of course, knew Buryat on a different level, and then missionaries and um, um, school teachers as well who were associated with the um, Orthodox Church uh, knew quite a lot of Buryat. So, so there were, yeah, there were quite a lot of Russians. And actually to this day, it is the case that there are quite a lot of Russians. They're often not, you know, not kind of considered in discussions about Buryat language vitality because there's such a conflation of ethnicity, race, and, um, and linguistic ability. But in fact, there are quite a lot of non-ethnic Buryats who, who do speak Buryat. Um, so we're coming to a close. Um, I guess I have one last question. Um, in, in the new kind of constitutional amendments and constitutional convention that took place over the last six months, uh, the constitution now includes the phrase of the Russian language as being the language of the state forming people. Uh, did that pr produce a reaction in, in amongst the Boryats? And to, to what extent does the, do, does the kind of assertion of, of Russian, the Russian language impact the drive for kind of greater autonomy in the yeah that's yeah that is a painful question and the i would i would put alongside that the um the language law from 2017 the summer of 2017 as well um these are two two political changes legal changes at the level of the federation that are not not welcome in Buryatia. I think what's fascinating to me is that and they're yes they're both they're both very painful um What's, what's fascinating to me is the way that um, over the last 10 years since I completed my, the research that's outlined in the book, the, there has been a great deal more political protest than ever before in Ulan Ude and in Buryatia, and a great deal more um, um, rancor um, and, and sort of distrust of Yedinaya Rasia and United Russia. And what's fascinating about it is that it hasn't, it hasn't been expressed primarily on ethno-national or ethnic grounds. And so those, the, the changes, the, the re-emphasis um, on Russian as sort of first among languages, frankly, um, is painful and is yet another, it's, it's almost like it's taken as like just yet another example of not being able to determine one's own destiny in a much more thoroughgoing way than, than is um, exclusively um, ethnicity. And so I, I've been surprised and kind of impressed by the extent to which political protest in um, and more willingness to to speak out against central authorities in Buryatia has come about not as a result of the of these sort of specific ethnic um, 
sort of points, um, but rather as a kind of as a broader kind of um, frustration over um, a lack of political direction and a difficult economic conditions, actually. You, you talked about the decrease of the number of Boyats who actually speak the language um, over the past five, 10 years. Um, what is the reaction to that? I mean, it would seem that, that is there less identity than as, as a Boryat, or is it simply, you know, the choice of how you integrate into the wider, wider world? And in order to do so, uh, the language is Russian and not obviously Boryat. So the terms that people most often use to describe the loss, the decline in the number of speakers and the sort of the, um, contraction out of uh, public spaces of Boryat over, over the years that they've been alive, the terms that they most often use are like pachalna, like grusna, like sad, um, sadness, it's, it's unfortunate, it's, um, it's regrettable, it's um, something that feels, however, to many people like it's not within their control. So the way that and you can kind of you can kind of hear tell tell from those those um, those terms too that it's something that is a state of the world that is a sort of necessary outcome of political and historical changes. Um, as one editor put it to me many years ago, um, very 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 an editor very invested in the future of the Buryat sort of ethno nation. The way he put it was to say that um, well look Buryat is associated with our bygone nomadic civilization. And it hasn't been adapted correctly for the 21st century. Um, and that view, I mean, he was, he was very eloquent in the way that he put it, but that view is um, shared by, by many people who just think of it as like Buryat is too indexically tied to the past. It's too redolent of, of a past and not, um, not indexed to the future. So some of the best, this is a more subtle, point, a subtle answer to Elizabeth's question about practical things that you can do as a language revitalizer. A lot of language activists are trying to sort of re-index, like reassociate Buryat with more progressive, a more progressive future oriented sort of um, um, appeal because um, it, because the overwhelming feeling of, of people and the discourse around Boryat seems to be that it's associated with a sort of bygone, bygone nomadic civilization and uh, a past that it can't be returned to. And that is, I mean, that's, there's, that's not agentive. That's a, that's a sort of statement about like, you know, how you lose out in the, the sort of winds of history. Um, so yeah, overwhelming sadness is the primary, the primary mode. Sorry to end on a sort of downer. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 but, it's okay. It's okay. It's, it's just speaking truth. <laughs> it, it, it's it's not a mixed message. It's a conclusion, and it's, uh, that's something to be encouraged. Well, can I say though? Can I add though, Will, to that that I do mm -hmm. think that I do think that the that an important lesson for sort of the rest of us, like non Boryats, is that it isn't it isn't Boryats' fault that they were put in this pos crazy position. It's very similar to the to the problem of of requiring requiring um, Native Americans not to speak their native languages, you know, sometimes, sometimes using brutal means for decades, and then requiring them to speak their native languages as like a criterion of political and ethnic autonomy. It's like, it's, it's a deeply unfair situation. Um, so it's, it's sort of sad for the rest of us as well as for, as well as for Boryat. Just one last question then. Do most of the politicians then not speak Boryatia? Correct. Most politicians in Boryatia do not speak Boryat. Yes. Okay. Yes. There are, however, there are, however, some opposition groups and opposition political movements um, uh, that have they've effloresced in the early 1990s and again effloresced in the early 2000s. Um, so mm -hmm. periodically, there's a sort of movement for more more Buryat speaking political representation. Yeah. Well, on that, we're going to close. Um, the book is Mixed Messages from Cornell, and if you use the code Flyer09. Uh, you can get a discount, a 30% discount uh, when you purchase the book. Um, in closing, though, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Graver, and I also want to thank the Title VIII program for the continued support to the Kennan Institute and to the scholarship in not only traditional politics, but in politics of the vast space of Russia. And thank you very much for that. And we Look forward to you coming and participating in future Kennan Institute events. Thanks very much. Thanks, Will. Mm -hmm.